Hello, and welcome to the watering hole. Thanks for checking out this clip. Don't forget to like and subscribe because that'll make the baby Jesus cry. And I know how much you guys love making the baby Jesus cry. Next, we have, again, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying, I'm trying to do fresh angles that I haven't seen before. So um, we all heard the story of the guy who works at Google who thought the AI was sentient. And have, did you read the transcript? Mm -mm. So I, I very much got the impression that this was, um, this is a, this is a chat bot that is very, very good at sounding human. Mm -hmm. Very good at it. Um, but he was, um, The chat bot was not saying anything of its own volition. It was always responding, responding to him. So when he prompts it with a question of, do you have emotions? The chat bot then scrubs conversations on the internet to see like, do people like it when, when, when they're, have emotions. when, when the people responding to them have emotions or would they prefer someone dead and robotic? Oh, they'd prefer emotions. So he so the chat bot comes back and says, yes, I have emotions. Um, so it struck me as like very, very much um, like if, if you uh, if you do any of the reading of like um, the like police interviews and how the like the experiments that they've done with um, false memory implanting, mm -hmm. it's it's very reminiscent of that where like the police without even necessary like the interrogators, not necessarily police or re researchers or police could go either way, depending on how they're looking at it. Um they are they are implanting the seeds of what they're expecting to hear out of the person by the way they're asking the question. Mm -hmm. And that was very much what I got out of that conversation was that like this, this AI is not sitting there thinking on its own. It's not going to like just start typing one day without an input saying like, hey, guys, I'm kind of bored right now. Can someone come and chat with me? Someone do like something. It's, it's yeah. not going to initiate anything. It's waiting for someone to ask it stuff. So it, it's pretending to be sentient and it's done a good job at that mm -hmm. uh we've got a super chat who's your buddy says i wish we had some automated semis yang talked about it would really help with the supply chain issues right now yeah didn't musk actually like demo one of those is that another one of his things that like he did a prototype and then never did anything else with it i think wait wasn't there like he's, he's they made, they've made a, a pickup yeah, no, I'm truck. talking about a semi, like an actual yeah, full I, big truck. I there there are electric that. trucks. Um, there are also hydrogen powered trucks. Like uh, um, that tends to work better out where there's more hydrogen infrastructure, like California. But um, um, there's also I oh I'm I'm pulling from years old memories now, so there's a good chance I'm wrong on this. But I seem to recall there being something where um, there's like a convoy of trucks where the lead truck is driven by an actual truck driver and then all the trucks behind it will like they'll have like cameras on the front that are like reading a qr code on the back of the oh, truck wow. and they like they use that to follow where that truck goes Interesting. Um, so yeah there's there's a lot of potential technology there that i'm sure a lot of truckers are not happy about anyway so this is this is not just going through the story of um, the the Google employee that got tricked into thinking the AI was sentient. This is uh, talking about how um, our perception of sentience, or actually, you know, sentience might be the right word. Is there, there's a difference between sentience and sapience, where sentience is the ability to think and reason, whereas sapience is the ability to like reflect on your thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, I might've drawn the line at it, like, cause sapience literally means like wisdom. So it, like reasoning might be more in sapience than sentience. It's, it's a fuzzy line. There is no, like, this is like, there's, there's no hard cutoff point. Um, anyway, I'm being pedantic at myself for like absolutely no reason. Uh, Rhino's right. Can't do end to end delivery, but can do port send. I don't know what that means. Is that referring to the truck convoy? I think so. Okay. So like they can, they can't go all the way, but they can just like do highway driving or something. I don't know. Ooh, watchmaker. Hi. 
You weren't subscribed already? What took you so long? How watch Miker? I know. Uh, yes, I did promote this on Twitter. I think. I might have forgotten <laughs> it send. Okay, back to the Google AI. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm like like I said, I'm kind of frazzled tonight, so I'm just like all over the place. It's fun. There are puppies coming. All right, puppies. So anyway, this uh, this article gets into how um, researchers are finding that um, that people tend to have this cognitive bias where when you see fluent language coming at you, when you when you're experiencing this is specific to text. So when you're seeing fluent text, your brain interprets that as there being a mind behind it, and this is because like that like reading text as a form of communication is evolutionarily speaking incredibly new mm -hmm. we have not had time to adapt to this at all um like as far as evolution is concerned the the development of written text is like yeah so recent that it just and it, it's so pervasive now that it just kind of hits us like a brick but so um we've kind of had to come up with these cognitive shortcuts where like okay well we assume like we know that these things are written by people so we just assume that there's a person on the other end and so that kind of leads us into the ability to be tricked by automatically generated stuff if it's sufficiently fluent and um coherent yeah so the and the, the so the thing is, like when we're reading it our brain actually like in any conversation our brain takes shortcuts to try and create a model of what they think of what your brain thinks the other person is trying to accomplish with this conversation. Mm. And then when you, it, it's, it's a way that um, it's a way for you to kind of keep up with the conversation where you can anticipate where they're going to be going with it. So you can have your response ready without actually missing out on the content of what they're saying. Um, obviously some people take it too far and you get the people that are just thinking of the next thing to say rather than um, concentrating on what's being said. Yeah. Um, but like, so that, that's like this taken, uh, no, not too extreme. That's, that's like not enough of this, I guess would be mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. So that is like a cognitive shortcut that we've developed that is now being tricked by these chatbots, and, uh, it, it can make it so the people that are even intimately familiar with these things, like a Google developer, you, you don't get to be a Google developer without being a pretty smart guy. Yeah. With one would assume experience with computers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, and we've been trying to do this with computers since the 1950s. Like they, they uh, developed Ngram models, which was basically uh, they would statistically analyze text to see what words are supposed to come up next. And um Essentially, these new AIs are exactly the same thing. They're just better at looking at the context. Um, and there, there's some fun examples that they have. Uh, like uh, there's the GPT-3, which is another one of these chatbot things. Mm -hmm. um, they gave it the prompt peanut butter and pineapples blank and like have the thing fill in the blank. So this is an example of something that like it might kind of come across as the GPT-3 having had an experience because it came up mm -hmm. with peanut butter and pineapples are a great combination. The sweet and savory flavors of peanut butter and pineapple complement each other perfectly. Mm. So you read that, you feel like someone just made themselves a peanut butter and pineapple sandwich and tried it and right. are now explaining their experiences. And your brain creates this whole model of a person doing that in order to come up with this. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, it can be hard to separate that from a conscious person. But then on the flip side, one of the things they got in here, which I found interesting is that, uh, this, this also works backward where when you encounter someone online that has different typing or different text patterns than what you are comfortable with, like someone that might use a lot more slang or someone that English is or what, whatever language you're typing in is not their first language. Mm -hmm. And so it might come across as broken you then your brain sees that as not fluent so it dehumanizes that person and makes it easier for you to like okay well this isn't a real person with real experiences so i'm going to dismiss what they have to say and treat them like garbage mm -hmm. i wonder if that plays into um 
I, f- I feel like older generations have are more likely to dislike um, like tech speak. Um, like stereotypical teenage tech speak that um, see you next Tuesday written letter C, letter U. I like, I feel like my, my parents have more of an issue with that because they think it's like lazy and comes across as kind of stupid. And I like, I wonder if that's, if there's a, a connection in there that when they read it, your brain says, actually, this is not fluent language. The person writing this is not I terribly would, intelligent. That's, that's an excellent insight. I, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I'd be interested to see if that actually is the case. Cause yeah. I, I actually, um, I have always kind of had to fight with, uh, linguistic elitism, I guess you mm-hmm. might call it where like, I like the way I learned language, that's the yeah. correct way. And yeah. anyone that does it differently is an idiot. Yeah. Um, and like, I, str- it, I struggle with that too, actually. No- Normally it's just like playful stuff where it's like, oh, you Americans and your laziness without putting the you in. I was going to say, you stuff. need more use in this. Yeah. Like you have it, use it for goodness but it, sake. But it's like, it's, it's not a necessary letter. It doesn't no. actually tell you anything about how to pronounce the word. It's like, I, I can completely see the argument for getting rid of it. Um, but at the same time, I still it's use supposed it. supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it annoys me when spell check gives me issues for that. Um, but like, yeah, I, I've, I've had to like make an active effort to be like, okay, well this, this person is not typing in a way that is grammatically correct, mm-hmm. but I don't know why they're doing that. Maybe they don't speak English as their first language and this is their attempt. It, like they're doing better at English than I would do at their language mm-hmm. guaranteed. Cause I don't speak it. <laughs> um, so like there, there could be a lot of reasons for that. Like maybe it's just like, maybe it is carelessness. But who cares? As long as I understood what they are trying to say, the then yeah, then the formatting, the the formatting is secondary. And, yeah, and like there is something to be said for, especially like if you're writing articles or like something that's going to be published. There is something to be said for like using the proper grammar and punctuation and all that, because then that's that's going to be the most clear to the most people. But like in one-on-one conversations, like who cares if you capitalize after the period or not? Yeah. Like, as long as we all know what you're talking about. Uh, meta, uh, meta, how do you spell that? Oh, I thought that was meta for a second. I don't know. What is meta? Alma mater. Is what the... Alma mater? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a response to... I just got an ad for my alma mater. Alma, alma mater. Marta? Mata. <laughs> Okay, that's now one of those words that I have thought about too much, and so I won't be able to even say it ever again. <laughs> I have that vague. I can't say vague properly I because I, there was one video where I said it like five times, and my pronunciation just kind of slipped a little bit in between them, and I got so many comments about it that now every time the I I say the word vague, I think of that, and it gets me in my own head, and so I it it comes out like the the a is just too a ish. I guess. Um, Vague. See, now I'm worried that I say it wrong as well. It spreads. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I just thought that was an interesting uh, perspective on the yeah, it uh, is. on the AI thing. 